Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cynthia Asen, and I'm a dealing representative with Integrated Equities. For the past 30 years, I have helped people invest in real estate. And many of my clients have asked me how they can pass their wealth to their children, their family, without a significant tax burden. Life insurance provides liquidity tax-free to the estate when money is needed to pay taxes. So this is the focus of my interview today. We'll be exploring options and explaining the benefits of using life insurance for intergenerational wealth transfer. My guest today is Rick Goldring. Rick has been a financial planner for the past 30 years. He has served as a mayor for the uh, mayor of Burlington, Ontario, and he and his wife have invested in real estate for 20 years. Welcome, Rick. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Pleased to be here. Great. So, you know, Rick, um, thanks for taking the time. And, and you know, I, you told me a personal story, which I would like you to share with the audience. I think it really tells me why you do what you do. And more importantly, why everyone should have life insurance as part of their financial plan. Yeah, yeah it is an interesting story. You know, I was born on my dad's uh, 45th birthday and my mom was was 41. And, and back when I was born, that wasn't very common. It's much right. more common today. My dad was a bank manager. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. And, and uh, I have a younger sister who's three years younger. And when I was eight years of age, my dad was 53. Uh, he had a major heart attack and he was in the hospital for, for months. Um, obviously, the treatment back then is not as good as it is today. Um, but he was in the hospital for months. I learned later that he almost died. And uh, I know from talking to my mom and my dad a little bit, but more my, my mom, when that was going on, there was all sorts of stress that they both felt. And for my dad, he had great concern if he died, what would happen to his family? Because he didn't have a will. He didn't have life insurance. Um, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. So he knew he was putting his family in jeopardy if he passed away after his heart attack. So, and, and he could have bought life insurance, but he didn't trust life insurance agents. He was a bank manager and he didn't have any time for life insurance agents. Um, so he didn't have any. And uh, so when my dad told me that story and, and uh, you know, gave me the background, that gave me some, you know, inspiration to help other people be prepared to not be in the position that my family was in, you know, if a loved one passed away. Um, and and uh, I still think of that on occasion, how if my dad had life insurance, it would have eased the pressure on him dramatically and helped his health in a, you know, I believe in a significant way. Yeah, stress is not good. And, and the more and more when they look at disease, you know, diseases and ongoing chronic conditions that, you know, it's related to high levels of stress. So I agree. And uh, I personally have just gone through the exercise of, you know, structuring myself to do this. So I, I wanted to share just the nuts and bolts and the basics. And then, you know, people that are listening have more interest in this. I encourage them to reach out to you and, and have the discussion. So maybe let's just start with how can you use uh, insurance to transfer wealth to the next generation? Well, I, I think first of all, um, you know, when you reach a certain age or a certain point in life, at, at some point when you do some analysis, you realize that all the money that you have, you're not going to need in your lifetime. And the money that you're not going to use during your lifetime, you're going to invest somewhere. And that investment doesn't matter what it is, it's going to be exposed to some form of taxation, whether it's generating interest or dividends or capital gains, you're going to be exposed to, to tax. So what life insurance represents is an opportunity to take some funds that maybe you don't require in your lifetime and set it aside in a tax exempt structure, which is what life insurance is when thoughtfully designed, have that money accumulate in the, inside the policy on a tax exempt basis. And upon one's passing that those funds, the death benefit for an insurance policy is paid out to the heirs completely tax free. So life insurance is really one of only four remaining tax shelters when you think about it. We have our principal residence where there's no tax on the gain. We have tax-free savings accounts where there's no tax on the growth or tax on the gain um, or tax on disposition, but we're very limited in how much we can put into that. Lottery winnings are completely tax-free, but the fourth um, tax shelter really left in Canada today is life insurance. And most people know what life insurance is, but they have 
no idea what it can do. Exactly. And that was my experience as well. You know, I went through this just last year and, and realized, geez, I think it really pays to start young. I mean, I, I would think that, you know, had I done this 20 years ago, it would have been a lot less expensive. Maybe you can talk about the benefits as a young person to do some exercise and, you know, start early. Well, I, I mean, there, there's two components really that, that benefits you when you're younger and purchasing insurance. And one is uh, the cost of insurance is, is much less uh, when you've got, you know, the life expectancy is another, you know, 40 years as opposed to 20 years. It makes a big difference in the cost of insurance. And as, and as far as the number of years you have to have the policy in place, you know, compound interest is a, or compounding is able to take place over a longer period of time. So the numbers uh, work well in your 60s and 70s, but they work even better in your 40s and 50s or even younger. Yes, that, that makes sense to me. I guess just time, time will accumulate. Time, exactly. So maybe let's talk about what options are available for, for people when they're considering using life insurance. Yeah, so certainly you know, you've got to take a look at the situation that somebody's in and, and see, in fact, what the goals and objectives are and what one is trying to accomplish and then sort of focus on what sort of insurance solution may fit in, in, the, in the situation. So most people are aware that there is term life insurance, which is something you buy when you're young and you've got young kids. And, and God forbid, like in my dad's case, if he died, it would have been very rough on the, on the surviving family. So you buy a lot of term insurance because it's cheap. Um, and it does provide that you know, great coverage when you're young and you need lots of uh, coverage because you don't have a lot of money yet or a lot of wealth. Um, but in the longer term, term insurance is not a, a, a long-term solution. Term insurance is the equivalent of renting an apartment as opposed to owning a house. Um, when you own a house or you own a life insurance policy, uh, you build up equity inside the policy. And, you know, I call the cash surrender value, the cash value, it's really like the equity in real estate. And the market value is really like the, the total death benefit that's paid out when somebody passes. There, there are different options that you can um, use in insurance. Most people today, for the longer term, are using some form of participating whole life. Whole life has been around for really over a century with some companies in Canada. And companies have been paying out dividends each and every year from their participating policies that accumulate inside the policy and grow completely tax-free. And you can have insurance within your corporation. You can own insurance personally. You can have life insurance on a single life basis. So what that means is if I have coverage on me upon my death, the benefit is paid out. Or there can be joint life and last to die coverage which would apply in situations where potentially the, the tax liability is not an issue in one's estate, estate until the second spouse dies. And if that's when you want to have the insurance kick in to cover off taxes, then you would enter into what's called a joint life and last to die life insurance policy. And right. the proceeds or the death benefit is not paid out until the second death or the second spouse passes on, then the money's completely uh, paid out uh, tax-free. And uh, there's, there's um, many other things we can talk about in, in context as far as, you know, setting up the right purpose for insurance. Right. And I guess that just brings me to like, not one size fits all. Um, so, you know, how, how do you determine the best option? You know, Really, you have to do an analysis. You you need to be like the uh, the, the Mayo Clinic, and uh, I like to consider what what we do in our, our business, or some of us do anyway, like the financial Mayo Clinic. We do a deep dive diagnostic before we come up with a solution, and only when we do the diagnostic and we understand the goals and objectives and the financial situation of our clients, then we can recommend accordingly. And, you know, whole life insurance represents um, different things to different people. In some cases, you would use it strictly for estate payout, to build up your estate tax-free and have it be paid out completely tax-free. There's other examples where you can let the money accumulate inside the policy. And then by using leverage, uh, using the policy to provide a retirement income uh, down the right. road. 
So it really depends on what the situation is of, of our clients and what they're attempting to achieve. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, everyone's different. So, you know, what if you have assets held personally, jointly with a spouse or jointly with another partner um, or inside corporate entities? How do you how do you figure that all out, too? So when somebody has a corporation, um, often people have money. When you think about it, that's trapped. And then I reason the reason I use the word trapped is the money is in your corporation, but you know, in order to get it out, you've got to dividend it out or T5 it out to yourself. And it's completely taxable at that point as dividend income. So when you have money inside the corporation and you leave it there for a while, it could be subject to triple taxation, tax on the investment growth, tax on the capital gains of the company and tax on dividends when it flows out uh, to your estate. So Often, the first place to look to place an insurance policy is inside a corporation. I'm working with a client right now. Uh, he and his wife are 66 and 65. Uh, he sold his business earlier this year, um, and he's investing in, in many different forms of investment, including some of his uh, investments are uh, with Cynthia, um, with you, Cynthia. And but we're looking at money he has in his corporation and, and what we're analyzing the benefits are, we're probably going to end up doing it. He's got about a million dollars in this corporation. And of course, if he takes it out, it's all taxes, dividends. What we're looking at doing is siphoning down that money uh, every year, investing in something that generates interest every year. And we're going to draw in some capital every year and drain it down to nothing over 10 years, but have it build up in the insurance policy. We're converting money that would be forever taxable inside the corporation, and we're converting it to um, never taxable personal assets. And we've done the analysis, as opposed to leaving the money inside the corporation and, and paying tax on the interest and paying tax on dividends when it's, when it's paid out, the money can build up inside the insurance policy completely tax-free. And when he and his wife pass, the money can be paid out of the corporation through the capital dividend account to their estate or to their children completely tax-free. And the analysis shows he's going to be about 1.3 million or as a state's going to be about 1.3 million or $1.5 million greater because right. of using the insurance as opposed to just leaving it in the corporation. Yeah, no, these are all, like I say, it's good to understand this. And I think you've done a great job, you know, dumbing it down for me um you know it makes sense and i you know i i have incorporated this but you've now explained it to me so i can understand it <laughs> okay. um yeah well, and so you know premiums so i i did this last year so i'm older and so the premiums are quite hefty so let's talk about what options might be available for someone considering doing this strategy later um, you know, after they've built a lot of wealth, but also they're older. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's different forms of permanent insurance you can use. You can use uh, a term 100 policy that has no cash values, but has a level premium and you pay that level premium each and every year until you die. But you're not building up any equity. You have to pay that policy for the for the rest of your life. Um, so one of, the, one of the strategies that we use is we reallocate existing investment dollars reallocated into the life insurance policy. So we're not, in fact, taking money out of cash flow, we're taking money out of ex existing investments. Another thing to consider is that, you know, some people see the benefit of, of life insurance and understand the, the tax preferred nature of life insurance, but don't like the idea, say, of, of, of tying up $100,000 a year for 10 years or a million dollars ultimately in a life insurance policy. There is a structure that one can use called an immediate financing arrangement. In this case, we structure whole life policies to have very cash, very high cash values early on. So let's say we have an example of a $100,000 premium and that generates very high cash values in the first year, almost maybe almost as much as the policy costs. So you set up the policy on, on today with $100,000 of premium, you assign it to the bank tomorrow, 
you assign it. And so they have the access to the cash value if you don't pay for the policy or, or deal with a loan. And we do that every year for 10 years. So we take, you pay $100,000 in year one through year 10 each and every year. And every year when you do that, we have a bank that lends you back the money you put into the policy. So when you do that, you're borrowing a million dollars over 10 years. But every year going forward, all you're paying is the after-tax cost of the interest. So it's not the interest cost you're paying, you're paying the after-tax cost of the interest. And when you borrow the money back inside your corporation and you reinvest it in some way, then the interest is tax deductible to the corporation. And the portion of the life insurance cost is actually tax deductible too. So this is a way that you could really have your cake and eat it too. You don't want to tie up a million dollars in a life insurance policy over, over 10 years. So you borrow that money back over 10 years and you're just paying the after-tax cost of the interest on an ongoing basis. So it's extremely tax efficient, it's extremely cost efficient in acquiring insurance in this manner. So that immediate financial arrangement, it's like leveraging your premium and, yeah. and you do get the tax deductibility as long as you invest it into something. Correct. Correct. Now, interest rates on these types of policies, I assume there's some range and I, I do you have to qualify to borrow? How, how does that work? So there are special tenders out there that are, are, this is all they do. So are mostly what they do. So for example, Manny Life Bank and Duke of Credit Union in Ontario. And there's others across the country that, that do this as a specialty. So this is a one-off loan. You want to package it together. You don't want to to encumber any other borrowing to invest you may be doing. So now it's very common for the major banks. They're, they're all into this. Some are better at it than others, um, but you can access it at your own bank. And typically the interest rate is around prime. And okay. depending on your credit worthiness, it could be a little more, or a little less, depending on what your situation is. Um, okay. And if, and if you really have good credit and you're, um, I have a client who's a real estate developer who who uh, borrows money on a regular basis from some of the big banks, and uh, he, he has a even better uh, deal because of the um, use of credit that he has and the credit history he has with the bank that he's uh, he borrowed money for the insurance policy with. That makes sense. Covenant is important. And so let's go into, like, how do you, I mean, I know you do the deep dive. Um, I guess, de determining the amount of insurance coverage, like if I'm young, I haven't made the wealth. <laughs> when I'm older and I'm doing it, I kind of have an idea because I'm already, I've done it. Um, is there any strategies you recommend for uh, younger people? Do, I mean, when you do their deep dive, you look at their picture, do you kind of, is there a formula for them to kind of figure out what they might need? So, so we use financial modeling software and we do some projections depending on the situation of what the estate may be worth at, at life expectancy and what the tax liability you know, could be based on a certain set of assumptions. And that provides some, some guidance to us as to the amount of insurance we want to look at. Uh, in other cases, people see the benefit. It's a case of, okay, I can reallocate $100,000 a year for 10 years. What will that do for me in adding to my estate? So it really depends on the individual set of circumstances. I, I should point out that I, I worked with clients who, in, in working with their accountants and their lawyers, have done estate freezes. So they've done an estate freeze and they you know, reissue uh, new preferred shares for themselves and give the gross shares to their children or generation two. So they've capped the tax implication to themselves. So if the tax implications is defined that we know exactly what the tax implication is going to be. Are we within a right. range of life expectancy? Then we can tailor an insurance policy specifically for that. And uh, estate freezes can make sense for people typically with a more mature businesses that have some clear direction of, of what they want to hang on to for the longer term and what they want the kids to have in the longer term. Estate freezes can make a lot of sense because you defer tax until generation two dies but often there's tax due when generation one dies. 
and that's what we determine how much uh, life insurance should be acquired. Hmm, good. That's great. I learned something else today. <laughs> now, uh, we talked about borrowing. Um, I think uh, the life to, to pay for the premium, and I think you covered that off. Um, and, and the interest would be tax deductible, but it really has to be if, if you reinvest the money to, to pay for the premium. Right. So, it, you know, you could be reallocating money that's in an investment inside your, your corporation. So, you know, you take 100000 out of the investment, you pay it in the insurance policy, and then the corporation borrows the money back and you've got that money to reinvest. And it's right. It's, it's simple that you, you created a, a, a tax deduction on the interest on the loan. Um, and so really, it really minimizes the cost and, and, and maximizes the efficiency of your dollars going forward. And when we do the analysis of these immediate financing arrangements, and it's depending on age and amounts and premium and so on and so forth, the after-tax return, the after-tax internal rate of return you know, can be in the range of six to seven to eight um, percent mm -hmm. after tax. Um, so that's quite quite compelling for a, a very uh, almost a low risk asset. That's a very compelling right. uh, internal rate of return. And you still got your original money that you put in the policy that you borrowed back that you reinvested in some other way. Yeah, no, it is pretty compelling. Um, so differences between personal and corporate insurance, maybe let's kind of do a recap. I know it depends on every situation, but I think there is some significant difference. I know you mentioned it, the capital dividend account, but maybe um, speak to the differences and you know when they would be used and why you would recommend one over the other, depending on obviously where the assets are held. Yeah, so you know, with individual policies that are individually owned, you can name anybody you want as beneficiary. Um, there's no restriction on that. Uh, when you have a corporate policy and the corporation owns the policy, the, the um, corporation, in fact, has to be the beneficiary of the policy as well. And you, you try to determine, again, what the purpose of the insurance is. Um, but nine times out of 10, when there is a corporation and there's, a, there's sort of excess cash or surplus in the corporation, we look to the corporation to house the insurance because, um, because of the triple taxation exposure potential of a corporation, the money accumulates inside a policy, inside the corporation, completely tax-free. And then upon death, the money flows to the corporation tax-free and then upon death, there is an account created, a notional account called the capital dividend account. And the insurance proceeds are received in that capital dividend account in the vast majority of the time, um, certainly in the later years, that money can be paid out of the capital dividend account to the heirs of the estate completely tax-free. Exactly. So we've kind of got three different uh, definitions here, uh, maybe just for the clarity with the audience and, and it's cash surrender value. What does that mean? For people that invest in real estate, let's call it equity. That's the equity that builds up in the policy. So you have a hundred thousand dollar premium in year one. Uh, at the end of year one, maybe the cash value was 80,000. So that's your equity. If you cash in the policy after year one, you wouldn't do it. But if you had to, you could cash in the policy and take out the cash surrender value of $80,000 in that one year example. Um, but the cash value builds up over time. And typically, um, you know, after eight, nine or 10 years, depending, the cash value or the equity is at least equal to, if not greater than the money that you have put into the policy. And it continues to grow after that. All right. And I want to say that, you know, you may you may start out at a certain strategy. So the objective is for estate planning purposes, you want to create the largest estate possible with the insurance. But the purpose may change after 10 or 15 years and you see there's, you know, a million, a million and a half dollars of cash value inside the policy. An investment opportunity comes up or you want to help your family out for whatever reason. You can assign the policy to a bank 10 or 15 years from now. Right. And the bank can lend you money uh, personally. 
And that money that you receive from the bank can be completely tax-free. If you use it for investment, the interest yeah. is tax deductible. If you're simply using it to help out family members and the, the interest isn't necessarily tax deductible, but it doesn't matter um, right. because you, you can borrow that money. You don't, you don't even have to pay it back while you're alive and you don't have to uh, pay the interest while you're alive. The interest would be capitalized and upon your death, the proceeds of the life insurance policy pays off the loan and the interest and the net proceeds go to your estate. Seems like a plan. So is there anything that you think the audience should know that's, you know, that I haven't asked and, you know, you're the expert, I'm, you know, learning alongside everyone else. Um, you know, yeah, what, what do you think, if someone doesn't have life insurance or they have term and they want to get more answers, um, we're gonna provide Rick's contact information, feel free to reach out to Rick. But, you know, is there something that you'd like to leave as we close off this interview? You know, how you feel life insurance changes people's lives? Well, I, I'm going to be a little specific about, you know, people that invest in real estate. And, and those of us that have invested in real estate in a thoughtful manner over the years, it's a great asset class. You know, we've done very well. Um, but CRAs are silent partner. They're smiling with glee as we successfully invest in real estate, because as our portfolio of real estate grows, the, the there's an increasing tax liability that grows. So the CRA is just sitting there on the sidelines waiting for you to sell. And if you don't sell while you're alive, well, then, <laughs> then you've got to sell. Your estate's got to sell or deemed to have sold everything the day okay. you die. Now you can defer that until the second spouse. So you defer it till until the second spouse dies. Well, at that point, you yeah. know, typically within six months of, of death, taxes are due. Yeah. And if our money is exclusively in real estate, um, it's not exactly liquid. Sometimes you don't want to be forced to sell a um, real estate at a, at a bad time. You want to have some flexibility there. And when you sell an asset, there's going to be some, some tax triggered. So real estate is to challenge some time with liquidity. It's a great asset, and but it does generate tax that has to be paid at some point. And if it's in the estate, there's a perfect complement there between real estate that is illiquid and taxable with life insurance that's completely liquid when somebody dies and completely tax-free. Because when it comes right down to it, to pay taxes when, when one passes, there's four sources of money. One is cash. And very few people have a million or two of cash sitting around to pay tax. Second thing is borrow. Do you want your estate to borrow money after you die? And how long is it going to take them to pay it back? Uh, and what interest rate are they going to uh, pay? Um, and do you want to have your estate uh, encumbered for that long while the loan's being paid back? Third thing is you can sell off assets, which may not be your, your first choice. And the fourth thing is life insurance with really pennies on the dollar you put money in escrow that's sitting there, that's completely liquid, that is paid out when the money is needed the most to pay the tax. Yeah, well said. And I, I agree. I think that um, the, the whole process is to build a financial plan that stands the test of time. But also, this really helps uh, pass that wealth on to your kids. And, and I think and, a lot and, of people are in that position now that are very interested in incorporating this into their financial plan if they haven't already done it. But I think there's new products and new ways that they can do it. And they should probably do a review if they've done it like several years ago and just make sure they're on top of, of the and, best options for them. And recognizing that the NBA playoffs are going on as we take this and the NHL playoffs are going on when we when we take this. And we know to win a championship, you need to have good offense. You need to put the puck in the net or the puck in the or the ball in the basket, but you need good defense as well. And insurance is defense. It's it's a, it, it's to provide some balance to your team or your portfolio uh, by providing, you know, risk-free, tax-free dollars when they're needed most. Perfect. Well said. Well, thanks, Rick. That was uh, very insightful, um, educational. And I'm looking forward to um, doing this again. And hopefully, you know, you're going to get some activity out of this, which I think you will. And uh, thanks again for your time. 
Great. Thanks, Cynthia. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks.